Okay, so just first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Dawn Thomas. I run a company called Nature Days, which usually is undertaking field work with from you know, nursery all the way up to A-level out in Gower on, in the South Wales. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are no field trips available and we're not allowed to do field trips at the moment because of the government guidelines. So Nature Days has gone online. Usually I undertake face-to-face -face ads and insect sessions with schools, trying to help them use their outdoor space more effectively to teach curriculum content. So what I've tried to do now is to move online to provide support to, stu to staff and to students so they can carry on doing outdoor learning, maybe not actually in their own environment, but in their gardens. So although I haven't been able to do face-to-face -face teaching, I've set up some virtual field trips on my YouTube channel, which is hashtag Nature Days. And also I do daily challenges for uh, home learning to help take the pressure off the teachers so that they can just highlight an activity, which is a challenge mainly based at Key Stage 2, but they can be used for any age group really in your garden with no equipment. I've also been creating outdoor learning resources, which I'll tell you about at the end. So the aim of today's webinar, as I said, is to try and empower you with some skills so that you feel more confident in going outdoors in your school grounds, and also think about some strategies of how you're gonna overcome the problem with social distancing, how to make outdoor learning more effective and efficient and also safe. Think about some good practice, think about some barriers that we may have to overcome, especially in this, in this COVID crisis that we're at. Some of my top tips, as I've been working in the outdoors, outdoor learning in, for over 20 years, I've got some tips which might help you to be a bit more confident in the outdoor learning environment. Also provide some activities that you can do which are socially distanced. And I'm also gonna provide some resources. I've created a Padlet, which you'll have access to at the end, which has tried to conglomerate amazing amount of resources that people have put online but it is a bit of a minefield because there's so much out there so I've tried to put it all in one place and also the Nature Days resources and what Nature Days can do to support your school and then finally we'll have an opportunity for questions so if you do have anything which is specifically to your school or your school grounds or topics that you're doing or anything I haven't covered in the webinar hopefully we can cover it in the questions and answers. Hopefully that's covered what you're planning to do and what you were hoping for with our webinar. So first of all, we're going to start with why we go outdoors, looking at it in the broader sense, but also specifically in terms of the conditions we are in at the moment. So it's been well known that going outdoors is very good for health and well-being. And as the students that have been at home for 12 or 13 weeks, their health and well-being is hopefully going to be the priority of all teachers when they go back to school. And in fact, in Wales, with this catch up and um, checking in sessions, the focus will be just on the health and well-being, not necessarily on covering any curriculum content. So we are going to try and empower you to do some more health and well-being outdoors. And I've got some lots of ideas for that. In terms of the five, the NHS five ways to, to well-being, many of them are easily covered by being outdoors. For example, being active. You've got more room to move outside. It's a lot easier, even with social distancing, if you've got the space, the children can move around without actually getting in close contact much easier than it is inside. The outdoors has got a natural calming effect because of the amount of greens and the soft shapes that we've got. So again, anxiety that's been brought up by this COVID, hopefully we can try and reduce that by bringing them into the outdoors. One of the other um, well-being ways is to take notice. So just being outdoors and hopefully trying to think about that big picture. There's been a lot of focus on negativity and all the things that are going on in terms of the COVID. But actually, if you go outside and look at the big picture, the birds are still singing, the plants are still growing, the flowers are still coming out. So hopefully we can get a bit of perspective for these young people and they can start to see that life is going on and there is still a wonderful world out there that they can connect with. And that's the other, that's the fifth way for well-being is to connect with nature. And everyone knows that if you go for a walk in the woods, it can make you calmer and peaceful and it can really reduce those thoughts and those anxieties. So if we do allow the children time to connect with nature, we will obviously be helping their health and well-being and giving them space to do that safely with their social groups is going to help them to learn better. Because if you've got healthy children, they're going to be learning better. There's an awful lot of evidence online, some of it on the Padlet, on about people having, uh, children having more space to move freely are actually better and more empowered learners. 
a physical activity can actually make you better in terms of your whole life, making you have a better physical life, a longer life, obviously, and a more physical life when you're older. Outdoor activities give you a better motor skills, but also gives you more confidence, more self-reliance, and lots of independence is being built on through the challenging environment that is outdoors. And it's not quite so controlled, so they do have to think outside the box. They have to think a bit more practically. So it's very good for them just cognitively as well. In terms of for this specific example, where we are now, is that we've got more space in your outdoors. Most schools, 70% of their actual space, their actual ground space is actually their outdoor space. It's only 30% of their land that's actually part of their building. So it does make sense that if we take the learning outdoors, that we'll be covering a lot more area and our children can be spaced out much more easily than inside the buildings. It's also important to stress that when the risk assessments were created for the schools to see how many children they were allowed to, um, to take so that they only get a third in, they looked at your space inside your building, not outside your building. So any outdoor space you've got is an added bonus to the indoor space in terms of how much room you've got for social distancing. Now I can, I appreciate there will be some schools that don't have a lot of outdoor space, but it doesn't have to be spectacular outdoor space for it to actually still be space. So anything you've got, if it's a yard, if it's just, if you're lucky enough to be able to go into a field you've got close to your school, if you've got some green open space that you can use, that would be a really good advantage if you can try and approach landowners or if you can go into parks. There are some issues there with health and safety, which I will try and um, touch on when we get to the health and safety bit. But anything that can extend the amount of space you've got in the outdoors is going to make your life a lot easier for your teaching. And the main reason for that is, as we've been told through this outbreak, being outdoors is great, it's fine. And that's because the, the, risk, the, risk, the risk of actually getting, transmitting the disease, uh, the virus is much reduced on the outdoors. It gets moved away. It doesn't last long when there's high UV levels. And also there's not so much materials that it can actually settle on. Man-made materials such as plastics are the worst for holding onto that virus for the longest length of time. Natural materials don't tend to hold it for as long and they tend to um, not be so contact, uh, um, transmitted so much by contact through those. So increasing airflow, if you look at your risk assessment for your school, most of it to do with trying to reduce transmission is spacing out and opening windows. Go outside, you've got more space, you don't need to open the windows because you've got natural airflow. So it makes sense to move your learning out to there. Unfortunately though, if you aren't used to going outside, there are some barriers and because it isn't such a controlled environment, there are some barriers which you may have to overcome. So I'm gonna go through these barriers, which are ones that usually come up whenever I do insets by teachers. And I'm gonna try and come up with some mitigation measures, which will hopefully I, you can use to identify strategies to reduce these barriers so that you can overcome them and they don't become a reason for you not to go outside. I should say that at the end of this um, webinar, there will be a feedback form. And if you feel that, fill that in and write your email address at the bottom of it, then you'll be sent this um, PowerPoint presentation. So you don't have to scribble frantically, which I always do whenever I watch a webinar. And therefore, it just if you want to just listen, then you can actually have access to all of these slides afterwards. So the barriers health and safety, or health and risk assessments, hazards. These are all words that have to be undertaken by every teacher all the time. And in fact, if you're in a school, you've probably just done the biggest risk assessment of your life, your 26 page document to get your children into school. And that has been a huge task. However, doing a risk assessment to take them outside is a much easier thing, especially when you want to take into account the COVID safety aspect. So if you're taking into account COVID, in fact, suddenly the benefits of going outside far outweigh any potential risk. If you consider the way that your school is set up, schools have got to be pretty low risk environments and your grounds has to be included in that. So you will always have a boundary fence. So your children are not going to rush off into the nearest road. So things like traffic is not going to be an issue because you've got that fence, your gates are locked. So already you've reduced that risk by the natural um, health and safety within your school grounds. Also, other things that might be issues in terms of the COVID, you've reduced them by taking them outside. It's easier to keep children apart. That social distancing is going to be simpler because they've got space to move. 
you've also got less, as I said before, of that transmission taking place. You might have to identify some things within your risk assessment for going outside, which might be unique, such as what if scenarios. So these might be things that in the past, it was quite straightforward. For example, somebody fell over and cut their knee. Fine, in you go, go and see the person in charge of first aid, they'll sort you out. In terms of this scenario, I've got an alternative suggestion, which I'll talk about when we get to the um, health and safety section, which might make it simpler and not have so many children run roaming around getting into school and out of school in this transition. But you might want to create yourself some documents, which I call your what ifs. So that's just basically thinking through every scenario that might happen while you're outdoors and coming up with a solution. So what if one of my students hurts themselves? Come up with a solution. Where's the first aid kit? How are we going to deal with it? What's the strategy? What if one of the gates is left open? Come up with a strategy. We're going to make sure we check all the gates before they go out. What if my students disappear and run away and I can't get them back? Again, come up with a strategy before it happens and then you'll be ready. So if you go through what we call a set of risk management techniques, we are looking at the potential things that could go wrong and you come up with strategies to deal with them before it happens, then you're already empowered to actually come up with a solution because you've already thought it through. Also, you should really consider it as not just a risk assessment, but a risk benefit analysis. Now, if you look at the Learning Through Landscapes website, and I've got a link on the Padlet for that, they have a whole range of generic be risk benefit analysis, ones for using your school grounds and other activities within your school grounds. These are very useful starting points, but you must adapt them to make sure that your school and any specific risks in your school are actually included in them. But the benefits are usually what's the most important at this point, especially when we're trying to maintain our high health and well-being and we're trying to reduce the risk of transmission, the benefits of, outside, of being outside are already very, very high. In your, if you're doing a risk assessment for your outdoors, you should also be starting to think about movement around that space. And again, I'll come up with some strategies later to show you how you can make sure that you know where people are going to be, how to funnel people into areas so that they don't have a lot of uh, people, uh, children and teachers congregating in one area, which would increase transmission. The weather. Now, on a day like today, the weather is fantastic and it would be wonderful to go outside, but it still can have some hazards associated with that. In normal conditions, you might say, that's fine, I've got a whole bag of waterproofs and sun hats, I'll just deal them out whenever they're needed. This may be an issue with the COVID situation in that you aren't sharing any equipment. So this is when you really do need your, your parents to buy in and to bring in that individual resource. But if you think about it, at the moment, the situation is so unique. I think the, the parents are probably in a much better mind to read your letters and to actually provide the necessary resources because you will be asking them to bring in a pencil, a pen, a ruler, a rubber and a lunchbox. They will definitely be sending stuff in with their children. Why not bring wellies, waterproofs, a sun hat, sun cream and make it all part of the same, um, same letter that you're sending out asking for those resources. So individual clothing labelled, keep them next to theirs so that if you've got two seats in your classroom, one's theirs, one's with their stuff, they can just keep them there and either take them home with them or leave them there for, the, well they will take them home because they won't be there for consecutive days probably, but then you know that you don't have to provide it. Same for sun cream, they'll have to put it on themselves and it's, you know, in terms of social distancing, it's something that we need to empower our children to do. Shelters, I'll talk a bit about shelters, but by the end of the week, I'm going to have a YouTube video up on how to create your own temporary shelters in your school grounds using very simple and cheap materials that don't require a lot of skills in knotting or anything like that. But shelters need to be in the right places and they also need to be safe. There's no point putting up a shelter and then increasing the risks within your school grounds by doing it. They also need to be in the right place at the right time. However, sometimes the weather can be against us or it can just be that you you can't cope with the weather that's there or the children can't cope with it. And that's when you have to adjust your activities or adjust your location. And I'll tell you more about how to position your locations within your school grounds to make sure you maximize the use of the weather a bit later. 
interruptions yes there will be interruptions and much more that, that are out of your control than you if you were inside your classroom worst thing you can do is try to ignore them if your children have found a worm and they're talking about the worm they're going to be talking about the worm until you clock the worm and you talk about the worm and then you move on there's no point ignoring them and try and get them to engage in what you're doing and when I give you some of the key tips, I'll explain how we need to embrace this really and not try and just ignore these interesting uh, interruptions. Time constraints, usually more of a problem. I don't think it'll be so much of a problem now because if you are just trying to check in with your students and you're trying to get them to have a, 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 just a good experience, then hopefully you're not trying to squeeze in too much. Whereas in normal times, you might be having your stock drillio in the morning, you might be having your literacy and the numeracy, and then the afternoon, you've got this small little section that you suddenly want to put in as much of your curriculum, your content as you can, and go outside. And that hopefully won't be the case now. And if you can be outside for everything, then you might re reduce the amount of time spent in that transition from going in and out and in and out. And the way to do that is to establish routines that encourage the use of the outdoors in your daily routine. And again, I'll go through some examples of that later. Lack of support staff. Again, this is a problem normally, but hopefully shouldn't be so much because you will have smaller class sizes. And again, you might have you hopefully will have somebody to support you in your smaller class sizes. But we do need to help our students to be more independent. Hopefully that's well, that's usually more of the case with the, the higher key stages. But it is part of the learning in foundation phase as well. So help, you know, trying to get them to put their own shoes on. Again, asking to, uh, parents to send in shoes that they can do up themselves, that kind of thing. And also a bit of peer support. But again, we have to consider our social distancing when we do that. Appropriate clothing. Again, I've said letters home. Good way is to model it yourself. Send a video home of exactly what you want them to wear. There's some great videos on YouTube. It's usually for cold weather, but it actually shows them exactly what you expect. And then they can't come back and they say, oh, I thought sh I short thought shorts and sandals was fine. You've actually showed them exactly what you want. And also you can reduce if they haven't got the appropriate clothing, you can reduce your timings. You can make sure the shelters are windproof or waterproof or they're positioned in a good location that will keep them um, um, sheltered from the weather. Losing control of your class. Yes but I don't think that's probably as anything you're worried about if you're inside your classroom. So the same should apply. So whatever discipline you use inside, you use that outside as well. There is no reason to adapt. And it's something that the children are used to. Really important in this time of catch up that they try and go back to things, routines that they're used to. So anything that you used to do, do it again, keep doing it outside they will understand and it will be familiar to them and that will get rid of any anxieties as well. So, for example, if after break you use a system of clapping, like I clap and you repeat, or you use a whistle or you use a bell, think about using those when you do your outdoor, lawn, uh, outdoor lawn learning. However, be warned, if you've got six classes all outside and six teachers all with a whistle and they all blow and expect their children to come back, it's not going to work. So you need to talk to your staff and come up with whistles that apply to your class. And you need to practice that before you go out and make sure your class are aware of what you're going to use to get them back to you. Because, yes, you can lose your class. They're not going to go far. They're only going to be in the grounds. But if you want them to come back to you and go to your area, then you need to have some kind of system that was suitable for your class, your age group and is different to the person next to you, the people next to you in the next class, so they don't all come to the same, uh, at the same whistle. Also, maintaining boundaries. When I talk about zoning our areas for our bubbles or for our classes, you need to negotiate and decide these boundaries and make them very explicit to your ch children, and therefore they shouldn't be passing these boundaries because they won't be physical barriers. And last of all, capacity. Because you've got your high level, your low level of students in your class, you probably will have lots of space. However, you do need to plan that space. So think about where you're going to get your group together when you want to talk to them. And they have to be able to accommodate that whole group with social distancing. So I'll give you some pointers to that in a minute. So what we're talking about really for the rest of this webinar 
is examples of ways of overcoming the barriers that we've just gone through. So examples of how you can do it and how you can make it fun and enjoyable, but also hopefully do some learning. Now, usually when I do inset training, we're always looking at learning outdoors and I do a big emphasis on learning outdoors in term, instead of taking learning outdoors. In this situation that we're in at the moment, both taking your learning outdoors and learning outdoors are both really useful. What's the difference? So taking learning outdoors is taking something that you do inside in the classroom and you just take it into the outdoor space, okay? Now that would work perfectly well in this environment. There's no reason why you shouldn't do that. So the first thing I'd think you could possibly do just to integrate um, outdoor learning straight away is to look at what you do in your indoor space and think, right, can I do that outside safely? And just a few examples of things that you can definitely do outside with not a lot of adaptation, silent reading, reading stories to your class, doing spellings, singing with actions, slot drillio, your Welsh, um, drawing, all these activities can easily be relocated into an outdoor space without much change at all. If you've got an activity that you really want to do and it doesn't fit in with the outdoor space, for some reason it just you just can't do it outside, then maybe at this time it's not the best time to do that or you'd have to find yourself a larger space if you're going to spread them out. You may feel the classroom is, is not suitable. But some, some just some tips to take your learning outside. If you're taking your students outside with paperwork, make sure they've got clipboards. And what I would actually recommend is if you possibly can allocate each student a clipboard and that goes with their pile of resources. So they've each got a clipboard. Now, if you've got a third of your school's um, capacity in clipboards, that's brilliant. If you don't, however, a piece of card with a bulldog clip or if you've got whiteboards, you can clip onto whiteboards with a bulldog clip as well. So you can make yourselves some clipboards, but it is very hard to actually do anything with paper outside without a clipboard. You could also use card instead of paper. So if you could use that as a resource that's always allocated to that child, and then when they've finished, take it, then you can wipe it clean, and then the next group can have it if you haven't got enough to keep them with that child's, the child's allocated resources then I think of clipboards as something that could be very, very useful. Also, if you are taking out paper, consider whether paper is actually the most appropriate or whether card would be better. If it's very windy, even on clipboards, paper can flap about like anything. So card sometimes is better to write on and using that just as the thing to write on can be easier. Also, in terms of writing, pencils are much better than pens. You can write on wet paper with pencils and pencils still work in the wet as well. So I would advise not bringing pens outside. If you are gonna go out and it's gonna be damp or wet, then of course paper is probably a bit of an issue and card does survive longer than paper in wet conditions. If you want to bring out paper or you've got some results tables you want to fill in or something that's got to be on paper because you had to print it out, one trip is to, if you laminate it, but with a matte laminate, not the normal laminate, you can write on that with pencil and then you can rub it off. So you can use that over and over again. And again, they could have that as their own individual. And therefore you can use that when it's wet. Or if you don't have matte laminates, you can use normal laminates and you can use Sharpies, but they don't work if the paper is, if the laminated paper is wet. Whereas you can write on matte laminates in pencil, even if they're wet. If you have got lots of paper, masses of paper that you're going to be using outside. I suggest you make it into a booklet because lots of paper are going to go everywhere. So try not to bring out masses of paper. And again, thinking about um, how you're going to be dealing with things like marking, etc. If you're bringing out books or masses of paper, all that is gonna have to sit for 72 hours before you can mark it anyway. So maybe this is an opportunity to move away from doing an awful lot of written work and if we just focus on the cognitive side of it, um, we can film things, we've got iPads, and maybe not focus too much on writing heaps and heaps. Or if they do, something they can take home and then they could put it on Twitter later on so they can take a copy of it and they, you still have access to that as a, in fact, you can put it in their books, but the paper is not gonna be something that's gonna cause a transmission opportunity. 
Whiteboards also great to take outside, but only work if it's not raining. iPads again, brilliant. A big issue with iPads, of course, if it's if you don't have enough for your class or Chromebooks. Also, if it's wet, you may not want to bring them out. And if you are taking them outside, check your Wi-Fi. If you've taken them out to your bubble of outdoor areas and your Wi-Fi doesn't extend that far, then you won't be able to access the cloud. So make sure that your Wi-Fi is working to the areas in which you are going. Learning outdoors, as opposed to taking learning outdoors, is actually using the outdoor space as a resource in itself. So that means using it for inspiration for, for actual learning subjects, also using it as loose parts. So you could actually find resources in the school grounds that you could use. And that actually is a really good benefit of going outdoors, especially when the amount of equipment we want to use, we want to reduce because every time we've got a piece of equipment that is shared or is going to be shared between our bubbles or our groups, we will have to disinfect it. However, if you use natural materials, they can pick them up independently, they can create things independently, and that material can then be left outside. You do not have to sanitize the ground you're sitting on, sanitize the ground, the grass outside, sanitize all the twigs. So it does reduce your workload because you will be having to clean every table that's you're being used. So if you're using picnic tables outside, you will have to sanitize those. One thing I will say is a, another tip, which I'm going to do a YouTube video on as well is if you can create some sit mats, you can use that just um, reusable shopping bags and put some padding inside it. If the students have their own individual sit, pat, sit backs or um, sit upons, when they come outside, they can sit that down and you can sit on damp grass or you can sit on uh, the yard and it doesn't matter that it's quite a hard surface to sit on. They can use their clipboards on their mat, on their laps. And then you don't have to worry about how many picnic benches you've got, you can also use it for your lunch time, so you can have your pat lunch with you and you're sitting on your sit upon, and then you can take it with you and you can take it home with you and you bring it in with you and then you won't have to sanitise it between users because each individual person has got their own one. So I'm going to go through some examples of good practice now, these are just things that I've picked up as I've been teaching outdoors. And hopefully they'll give you some ideas and some examples of how you can do make outdoor learning simpler and just hopefully some guidance here as well. So I said before about distractions. So if you can make your learning a bit more responsive and reflexible, then these distractions can actually be an advantage to you. So if you can embrace them, for example, if you're sitting in your circle and a bee comes along, if you can start you know, go off topic, yes, talk about your bee, have a look, can you see any pollen on its legs? Um, where's it going? Where, has it come from that flower over there? What's it doing? And then you can follow the bee and then think about how we can try and integrate that into the learning that we're doing. Also, you've got the weather. If you've got showers of rain, if it starts raining, obviously hoods up, but then think about how that's impacting the group. Ask them, what do they think? Do they like standing in the rain? How does it feel on their senses when they're there? Has it changed the way they feel about this, this, this environment or this location? Use the outdoors as an actual resource. So think about what you can do outside or think about what you can do inside. And is it better outdoors or is it better inside? And if it's better outdoors or if it's fine outdoors, there's no negative impact of going outdoors, then take it to the outdoor space. And that means you've got all of the issues that we talked about with um, sanitizing your tables and the space, those have all been removed. You've also got resources to so try and find activities that you can use the resources found in your outdoor space instead of using the plastics and things that are in your indoor space that you will then have to sanitize. You can just use the leaves, stones, sticks, anything like that. Lots of those loose parts, great for doing numeracy, um, making equations, fractions, creating artworks. There's so much that you can use loose parts for. And again, there's a great website called Creative Stars, and they've got some fantastic ideas on their blog on how to use loose parts for doing numeracy, literacy, and some great ideas there. So if you can't come up with some, use those resources there. You can also use the actual space as inspiration for activities, especially things like literacy. 
So if you're going to think about stories, then take a walk around your school grounds and find locations in your school grounds that could be part of the story, or they could be um, factors in the story. It could be that you find the main character in your story, or you're looking for adjectives that can be used in your story. So the inspiration of your grounds will help to make your whole experience much more meaningful and hopefully more interactive as well. When you've got your bubble or your zone, your area that you're going to be working outdoors with with your group, design it so that the social distancing can occur really quite naturally. So, for example, if you want your group to come to one spot and you want them to stand in a circle, if you place cones at two metres in that circle, then when they go, they can go and stand at a circle. And if they've got these sit upons, they could actually place that where this, the cone was and they can sit there and then they can leave their sit-upons there and that means they know exactly where they're going to sit. So you're not going to sit on a cone, are you? But if you sit on your sit-upon, you'll know where to come back to and it's your individual location, two metres apart, and they know where to come back to when you do your whistle. You could also use hoops as well. Hoops are a great place and of course those are easy to go two metres apart. Carpet tiles, but again you do have to wonder, you know, carpet tiles. Carpet is probably the worst thing for holding onto the virus for the longest amount of time. So maybe carpet tiles that are upside down, which are easier to, to wipe clean, but I would suggest making some sit-upons that probably be easier. Always pick a location that you can come together and identify that location to your class and make sure that that location is big enough for the capacity of your class with the two meter and also that's going to be comfortable. So it's not directly in front of a door that people are going to be in, going in and out of. It's not going to be where there's a lot of sun. It's going to have shelter. It's not going to be with a lot of rain or, uh, or there's going to be in a rain shadow if you can, or it's going to be in direct wind. So think about location and I'll give you some examples um, in a little bit for that. Again, if you are trying to make sure that everybody can hear you, you need to consider things like the sun, things that you don't really think about when you're talking in front of a class. So if you are talking in front of a class and the sun is in your eyes, it is not in their eyes. Not very comfortable, I know, but it means that they can see you and it means you know they're not going to be struggling looking directly at the sun. Also, the wind. Is the wind blowing your voice away or are they going to actually be able to hear you? Also, think about the landscape and using that to your advantage. If you've got an area which is high up, that's a great place for you to stand and you can see everybody, they can see you. And if you can't find any high land, you could maybe improvise. If you could use crates, something to stand on, something that makes you more prominent, and then hopefully they can hear and see you much better. These locations will have to be flexible because as the sun moves, as the wind moves, as the rain changes, you will, may have to relocate. So these are things to always think about in the back of your mind as you're talking to your, your students outside. Whistles, you really need a whistle when you're doing outdoor learning, just because it's the easiest way to get your students back to you. But as I said before, set your whistle commands ahead of time, practice in the classroom. I know whistles shouldn't be blown in the classroom, but at least they know which command means what. And if we reinforce commands that they've already used at playtime or you are now established for new, new ones for their groups, then they'll get into this routine and they hopefully should be able to you know, reinforce it as they come in um, after over the weeks. And of course, all this is hopefully setting us up for a really easy transition into September as well. So once you've reinforced these commands and these scenarios, hopefully in September, when you start a new routine, you've already established some of these ones. Defining boundaries. You've obviously got the big boundary of the outside of your school grounds, which they should be aware of, and all of your gates should be locked at all times, but that's just natural health and safety in all schools. But suddenly your boundaries might be smaller within that. First of all, you may be allocating areas of outdoor learning for each bubble or each of your school groups, and you don't want them to move from one to the other. So thinking about how you're going to demarcate those. You can use cones, of course. Rope is a really good thing on the ground because it doesn't have to be a straight line. And ribbons on bushes can be useful. Hazard tape. But do you really want a solid boundary that people are going to actually walk into? Chalk is good. But the important thing is, is to engage with your students and get them to have ownership over those boundaries. Maybe decide it together 
and then walk the bounds. So we walk around the outside so we know exactly where it is. And that way we can say, oh, right, we don't go beyond this point. So when you do blow your whistle and they've gone off, they shouldn't be beyond a certain distance or out of your sight. It also is an actual opportunity to undertake lots of math skills. This two meter um, social distancing that we've got, we could do a lot of measuring to find out what two meters is. Obviously it's two meter sticks, but how many jumps is it? How many steps is it? Um, how many bounces is it? So we can try and utilize some of the maths learning to make them think about this two meter rule and also thinking about how many of us we can actually put into a space if we've got two meters between us. So bringing in the problem solving that you're doing at the moment into the children's learning will hopefully get them to understand why it's being undertaken and also it gives them some good math skills as well. Transferring discipline from the classroom. Um, I've said before that if you have high expectations of behavior inside the classroom, there should be no difference when you come outside. All we're doing is changing location. When you change from inside the, your classroom into the hall, you still expect high expectations of behavior. This should be no different. But there are things, as I said, that were out of your control when you're outside. And children do find when they go outside, they, they consider that that is their playtime. So when you start this, if you don't take your children out for outdoor learning very often, you will find that when they come out, they will really be in the mood to suddenly run around and play because that's what they're used to when they're outside that is their outdoor play area so what you need to do is to instill in them that the behavior we get inside we expect that to be in this outdoor area as well we're just checking the classroom we're making an extension to our classroom that's all we're doing and also sometimes because this may take some time to instill in them and you haven't got a lot of time over these next three weeks you might want to undertake a transition activity and what I like to do is just to get them to stand in their circle, socially distanced, and then just get them to close their eyes and just breathe and just try and connect with the outdoor space and just listen. And then they're hopefully observing some of the distractions that they can then focus on then and later on, they're not gonna be such a problem. And there's lots of activities you can do to focus on that. You could do a fistful of sounds. So you put a thumb up or a finger up when you hear a certain sound or bird song or just sounds in general. And then it just means that they've made, uh, had an opportunity to look at all those distractions. You can then have an opportunity to talk about them. And then it's like, right, we've done all that. Now we're gonna do our learning activity. Or you might think, right, those distractions are even better than my learning activity. We're gonna go with those. And we're gonna be flexible and we're gonna change our approach to this teaching. In terms of integrating the outdoors into your daily routine, again, when you establish routines at the beginning of term in September, you have got your own way of doing it. So depending on what you like to do um, in your classroom, think about which ones of those could just be easily transferred to the outdoors. You, there are some new routines you will have to establish, but if you can just continue the old routines, but just move them outdoors, then again, it will reassure the children that not that much has changed. And also you'll find that some of them maybe work better outdoors and some of them that makes no difference, just the location is outside. So it means we don't have to worry about so much about the social distancing because there's natural space there. So if you've got things that you can take out with you, some activities that happen naturally in your routine and take them outdoors, then that will be really good. Again, things like your carpet activities, circle time, story time, silent reading, things like those, there is no reason why they can't be undertaken outdoors without much difference at all. And then lastly, dress for the weather. And the best way to get the children to dress for the weather is if you model it yourself. If you're outside and you're not wearing a waterproof and you expect them to wear a waterproof, then they'll question why it is the best thing to wear. So if you can send home pictures of what you expect your children to wear, and if you model it to the children that you are going to wear your hat, you're going to wear your sun hat, you're going to have your sun cream on, you're going to wear your sunglasses, then the children will hopefully see that that is the, the example that they're, they're going to follow. Okay, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at health and safety just because that is the, the most important thing. We have to keep our children safe. And I've said before about the risk benefit analysis and the learning through landscapes. 
um, resource there. But in terms of your risk assessment, just because you've written it down, especially if you spent the last three weeks doing it, that doesn't mean it is over. Your risk assessment is a dynamic document, which means that it will be changing all the time. So when you undertake a risk assessment for your outdoor learning and for the COVID, you need to be maintaining an understanding of that all the time and you need to be looking at it and seeing if it needs to change. And what I suggest you do is have a copy of the risk assessment for the outdoor learning and also for the COVID. And everybody in the school has a copy of this in paper form. And when you see something that doesn't work or something you need to change, you write all over it. Your risk assessment should not be a document on a shelf. It should be covered in pencil marks and it should be used and it should be adjusted and it should be changing all the time. Otherwise, it's just a piece of paper that you filled in for the sake of it. If things don't change, your risks will and you are not adapting to the situation. I said before about the first aid kits and usually having one person with an allocated first aid kit in usually the office and they're the dedicated first aider. In order to reduce the amount of movement in, in and out of the building, what I suggest is that you actually have a small first aid kit in every single bubble or every single group. And that accessibility then is going to be just for that class. And also, if your dedicated first aider could actually spend just a little bit of time training the rest of your staff just in treating minor injuries, it would mean that you wouldn't have so many people coming to um, that one location. I know there is an issue with PPE with doing first aid, so I'd have thought that the easiest thing to do for the older children, obviously it's different for the foundation phase, but is to try and empower them to treat themselves. So if somebody falls over in your outdoor area and you're in year five or year six, you say to them, right, you know where the first aid kit is, go and get yourself a plaster, go and get yourself a wipe, give it a wipe, put your plaster on it, and then put the rubbish in the bin, go wash your hands first and afterwards. And if they're doing it themselves, then it means that you're reducing the load on that one first aid or those few first aiders. You're reducing the amount of people moving around in and out of your building, and you can do that on site where you are. Also, in terms of the contents of your first aid kits, if you consider if there's anybody in your school who is vulnerable or the chance of having to do CPR, please ensure that your first aid kit has a mouth guard because obviously in terms of first aid, you don't want to be having to do CPR, but for paediatric CPR, if there is a case of COVID involved, then you will transmit it through the droplets. So face guard in your first aid kits. So these ouch pouches, which you might want to call them, or just little first aid kits, emergency kits in your classrooms, we're just talking about plasters and uh, wipes, something that don't need to go and see somebody who's going to put all their PPE on just to plaster it up when the child can do it themselves. You also need to risk, you need to assess the number of first aiders you've got. Again, if you're going wider than your school field or if your location is far away, you might want to think, right, who in this school has got a um, good level of, of um, first aid knowledge? Maybe their bubble of outdoor area should be further away from the allocated place where the other first aiders are because they can deal with themselves down there. Also, do we have enough first aiders? You may not be able to do a first aid course, but again, your dedicated first aiders could give a quick recap to somebody, the TAs or some of the, the teachers so that they feel more confident doing it. One of the biggest issues with this crisis is the issue of transmission through the toilets. And of course, the best thing to reduce that is hand washing. Unfortunately, where you're going to transmit it is in the toilet and where your hand washing might be is also in the toilet. And it's going to be very tricky to try and get lots of children going washing their hands multiple times in the day, going in and out of the toilets while other people are going in and out of the toilets to use them. So one suggestion is to create some outdoor hand washing areas. Oh. Okay. Now, this doesn't have to be anything technical at all. But if you do that, in, instead of having to go into your classroom, if you've got a tap in your classroom or having everybody lining up to go into the toilet two at a time to wash their hands, if you can set up an outdoor hand washing system, then every bubble can have their own outdoor hand washing system and therefore there's no queuing involved. 
This is one that was on the create, which was tweeted by Juliet Robinson, who does Creative Star. Fantastic resource there. And she's just set it up with water coming out of this spa tap in the middle. And then you've got um, kitchen roll covered with a plastic bag there so it doesn't get wet. And then a bin for the plastic bag and then just a soap dispenser. And these could be actually at two meter intervals. So you can have a number of children doing it at a time. And all you need is this five litre container. This can be just a spa bottle. Or if on the other side, you've just got a big bottle, a barrel, which has got a tap, soap, and then a big dispenser of paper. So it doesn't have to be complicated. I know in forest school, they make tippy taps, but just a piece of string with these attached to it could be enough. And I think that would be a very good way of reducing the pressure on the school inside. There is a great resource which has been created by Somerset County Council, which I've get, uh, put on the Padlet, all about how to do an outdoor risk assessment in terms of COVID. And this is the basis for it. And it's very, very good if you want to look through those. Right, moving on from health and safety uh, to some top tips. Now, we're going to start with thinking about how to allocate your outdoor space to your bubbles or to your groups. And we're going to think about zoning your space. So this is an example of a school. So if we consider zoning it into our areas for our groups. When you're zoning your area, your outdoor area, you need to consider a mix of different environments. So you want all each area to have obvious access, yeah. to, access to the building. So if they can actually come out through a fire exit straight onto the yard there, that would be perfect. If not, then you're going to have to think of a system of how they're going to move and think about pinch points. So imagine this has got a um, exit there. If we allocated this area here to this classroom, they have this area of yard that they can work on. They've got this area of grass and they've got trees for shelter. OK, however, if we consider the direction, so this map is orientated so that it is north up here, this tree here is going to provide shelter and shade over here, which is actually outside of our school grounds. So this area here is going to be in full sunlight after lunch. So if we consider things like the direction of the sun, the direction of our shelter and our shadow, we can think, right, if we are using this zone, we need to put up a shelter. The shelter could be here and it will provide shade in this direction on the grass. That's great. Or we could put it, maybe move this zone this way. If we put a shelter up here, then in fact our building would provide shelter as well as our shelter providing rain cover. We can also cover two zones with our shelter if it's big enough. We also need to consider the wind. So the wind is going to come from a southwesterly direction here. So if you've got a group that have this central part as theirs, this tree here is going to provide a nice bit of shade here. Great. So they've got some shade from the sun. However, the wind is going to whip up here. And if this shelter is too far, uh, and if, if we put up a shelter, say here on the grass, so that we're not actually under the trees, but we've got a nice gazebo here, the wind is going to blow here and this shelter might get blown away. Also, if we've got very high wind speeds, and if, you're, if your school is on high ground, that's, this is what you might find. This whole area here is going to be wind zooming through it the whole time. You'll have rubbish accumulating here and it'll be quite cold. So think about the direction of the wind. Up here, this is actually the best location for the wind. You've got a wind shadow this side. The building is going to block the wind from this side. So you've also got shadow from the sun. So you've got a shadow here. You probably won't need a shelter. You've also got the trees here. So if you've got vulnerable people, if you've got youngsters or you've got somebody, a group particularly that you think you really need to have lots of shelter for, maybe consider locating them in a location where you've got north, where you've got trees down the south. So they're going to have shelter for the afternoon and then not in the direction of the wind. Also, thinking about pinch points and how people are going to be coming out of the building and going to these locations. So if your front door is here and everybody who gets hurt over here has to walk all the way around into there to get their first aid done, 
then it means they're walking through a number of bubbles and have the potential for meeting a lot of different groups before they actually go inside. So consider either a system where people can go through the bubbles in a certain way, again, come up with a routine, or again, try and limit the amount of indoor and outdoor or all the way around. Okay, the rest of the webinar, I'm going to be focusing on, oh, sorry, no, I, let me go back to my top tips, sorry. So yeah, this is our zoning, and this is our thinking about movement between our classrooms. And if you can map it out, then makes you means you've thought about it. Outdoor shelters. As I said, I'm going to do YouTube video. Uh, gazebos are great because they help stop the rain coming down. But if you haven't got the sides to it, if you've got horizontal rain like we do have in Wales, then the rain's still going to get in. Also, consider your health and safety. You need, do need to guide them down. And if you do guide them down, you need to make sure your children are aware of the guidelines and they don't become a hazard. Transitioning from inside to outside. I've said about doing a little activity just to get them established outside. Try and establish the same routine so that you're not just changing everything. You're just moving it slightly. You're extending the size of your classroom. Again, an area where you can come together. Limit the use of the equipment. If you have to use plastic equipment, if you have a box which is full of soapy water, when they finish with it, they can just throw it in there. You can then put it in the sun to dry. The next group that uses it can just pick it up. So it means that you've still, you're washing your equipment, but you don't have to do a big job of getting some sprays out. Also, try and use as many of the natural resources as you can. One great way of using your outdoor space is to create trails, and I'll give you some ide ideas for trails. If you're using the wider school, not just your bubbles, then you can use trails for literacy, numeracy, and pretty much everything. There's some examples of a good maths trail on uh, the Padlet, and also Creative Style's got some great trails there. But it's a great way of moving people around, socially distancing, if you want to do a trail, which you can put up um, poly pockets, you can put in the questions or whatever you want them to do inside the poly pockets. They're waterproof. You can also change them. And if you don't want them, you could have a non-contact trail. So if you can make the poly pocket out of reach, they can't touch it or behind something so they can't reach it, then it means they're not going to be touching anything apart from their clipboard and they could just tick things off or answer questions. Also with the trails, you could do things like unnature trails. So again, try and tell them not to pick things up and they can still move around and under to undertake activities without actually touching anything. Also really important, especially at this time, to make sure you have time for reflection. So as I said before, don't try and squeeze too much in and make sure you have that time at the end to think about how they feel. Maybe start with an activity where they're actually considering the impact it's had on them, but in a positive light, what's been some good things that have happened? How have you enjoyed coming back to school? You know, what are three things that you missed? So reflecting on the activities and reflecting on their experience and getting them to look forward. So the rest of the, the, rest of the webinar, we're just gonna go through some ideas of what you could do in terms of activities. Now, health and wellbeing, as I said, vitally important and being outdoors just ticks so many boxes with that, but sometimes it's difficult to actually think of activities. So this um, slide here has got some ideas of some of activities that you could do. As I said before, um, this um, presentation will be emailed to you if you fill in the feedback form at the end and write your email address at the bottom so you'll have access to all of these. So in terms of the physicality, being outside, great for well-being, games, do need to be considered and the Somerset County Council have come up with a whole load of games which are socially distancing. Brilliant resource there on the pad Padlet but even simple ones like Simon Says are going to be great. You could then reinforce the routines, how to wash your hands, being you know all those things can be reinforced through those games as well. Anything physical is going to be an advantage to them getting a, a bit more active but it doesn't have to be anything technical that requires equipment. Tree bathing, so that's walking through the trees. Uh, barefoot walking, just making it slightly more interesting. Obstacle courses, again, using the natural materials. You don't have to bring out lots of equipment. Doing a bit of yoga, again, 
doesn't have to be anything complicated. Wildlife Watch has got some great animal yoga poses that you can do. It's not about getting it perfect. It's about moving and being in tune with your body and just having that time out. In terms of well-being, there's an awful lot of things you could do just to get them to reflect on how they're feeling. Thinking about creating worry leaves, that's writing your worries on leaves. Having a magic spot, which is just a location where they can sit and think and just be in that location and just feel the wind and everything surrounding them. Three words is just coming up with three things you're grateful for or three things that you like, three things that you missed. Gratitude circle, go around in your circle and getting everybody to say what they're gr grateful for or getting someone to sit in the circle and saying something positive about them. Guided meditation doesn't have to be too complicated. The one I like to do is I literally just get them to lie down on the floor on the grass and I just take them on a journey, pretend they've gone somewhere. And that's a good guided meditation because they're just lying there and they're being in that place and you don't have to do anything special, just take them on a lovely guided journey through the sky or into the sea or whatever, and they just get to relax. And it's a great way of calming them down as well. Um, you're connecting with nature. There's so much you can do outdoors. Obviously any activity outdoors is gonna connect you with nature, but just listening. Nature windows is when you lie in, in the grass or underneath trees and look up and just see that window there. Fistful of sounds, counting what you hear just feeling the senses as well, cloud watching, knee to tree. Again, you could do blindfold things, but do be aware if you're sharing materials, um, you might wanna use their jumpers instead. And of course you can't really go close to them if they're gonna walk into something. So knee to tree might be something you do using all your senses, including your eyes as well. Mindfulness, depending on the age group, mandalas, a great repeating pattern using natural materials on the ground. Um, if you're not sure, I've got a YouTube video on how to do mandalas really good for just focusing in on what you're doing and not thinking about anything else great to take you away from uh, the moment for the older ones things like journaling journaling can just be free writing so just literally get them to, they can write anything and you don't look at it you don't ask them to feedback on it it just gives them the time to out throw anything that they've got on their mind or free drawing draw what you like and again if you're doing that outside you have much more inspiration there and it's much nicer to be in a nice environment outdoors doing those than inside and reflection time. Make sure you do have that time to answer questions and to reflect on what you've done. So hopefully that's given you some ideas for some health and well-being ones. Um, I will say, um, I'll say it at the end, but I've created some outdoor learning cards um, for the six areas of learning experience and there's 50 of those and there's 11 on health and well-being and they're independent cards to help students to actually undertake activities independently and there's lots of activities there which would help with this well-being. Right, this is just me thinking out loud of what activities we could do with social distancing in the other five areas of learning and experience. An awful lot can be done outdoors and I'll just look at the, over here if we look at the hunts. So if you've got a hunt, basically you're looking for something outside that you haven't put there, so it's naturally there. And that could be anything from literacy, numeracy, or science or any of the OLEs really. But if you're looking for maths, you can look for multiples, what goes in threes, what comes in fours, shapes, 3D, 2D, angles, just numbers, how, how many of each thing can you find or can you find um, up to a hundred of something. Data, so data collection, that could be mini beasts or it could be anything that you're collecting. Literacy, again, trying to find things, finding adjectives, punctuations, you've got um, dots around somewhere, that's a full stop finding a story, phonics, metaphors, all these hunts, you don't have to set anything up, you just go and look for it around in your outdoor area. Trails on the other hand, require you to set things up. It does require a bit more planning, but if you can make sure that you've got things set up so you just have to slip in a paper into the locations in the poly pockets, you can do any amount of maths ones and also you could do literacy ones as well, unnature ones, and they could be as difficult as you like, depending on your age group, so we've got problem solving ones that could be like, um, how many bricks are there in the wall? If we wanted to extend this classroom by three meters, how many more bricks would we need? Each brick costs three pounds, how much is it gonna cost us? Or for the younger ones, it can just be how many rectangles are there or what shape is it? So you can vary it depending on it. I'm very aware that it is seven. I hope everyone's okay to carry on. I've only got a couple more slides. Excellent, thank you. Right, so humanities, now again, 
humanities and science and technology, the two important aspects of those are the inquiry process and the investigative process, both of which can be undertaken outdoors. And that's what I do in terms of field work. So if you're taking your students out and you want to do some humanities, you can do it all outdoors, pretty much. You may be making models of the things that you're teaching. So if you're doing about landforms, you can create those out of sand or out of soil, out of clay. I know there's been a push for not using Play-Doh and clay, but mud, great. And if you've got a clay soil, even better. But if you want to try and encourage the whole inquiry process or the whole investigative process in the sciences, then you can get them to start thinking about questions they could answer about their outdoor space. And if they're asking questions, you can follow that. So you can properly do the, the plan that we meant to do in, in, um, in Wales, that they come up with the question and then we follow it through with our teaching. So we're empowering them to be there to be self-led so they're learning for themselves so if we can use the outdoors as inspiration for that inquiry or for that investigation we can then come up with the proper investigative process or the inquiry process to come up with a fair test sampling data collecting data presentation and of course it's all should be doable because it's your school grounds and your school grounds is there available for you the weather is a great thing to investigate. Again, if you don't want or you haven't got any equipment, if I just lean over and if you can see, you can make your own equipment. These pinwheels here, again, I've got a YouTube video on how to make these. You just put them onto the end of a pencil and you can use these to measure the wind speed. So if you haven't got any equipment, and again, if they make these, they can take them home. So you haven't got to try and you know, clean your equipment. So you can measure wind speed with these. Temperatures you can measure just by comparing different um, surfaces, what, which is hotter than another, even if you haven't got exact um, thermometers. Also, you can be considering rain gauges, creating rain gauges or measuring the rain um, levels as well. Trampling, considering the impact of your footballers and their goals, uh, their goalkeeping on the size of your plants or the, the diversity of your plants. And soil is a great one to investigate. Again, I've got a YouTube video that you can measure the, the texture of soil and that doesn't require any equipment apart from water in your hands of getting a bit muddy. And rocks as well, great way of doing a trail around your school grounds. How many different uh, materials can you find, materials or rocks? Where do they come from? What colors are there, etc. cetera? Uh, science technology, I said about the investigating, so much you can do in terms of collecting data on plants, animals, and doing the whole inquiry process. But also you can do investigations into technology, so designing, and you can bring in expressive arts there, so you can design, and also some humanities. You could create forts, you could create roundhouses, you can create a shelter or a building. And again, if you're using natural materials, you don't have to worry about contamination or transmission. So using the natural materials to design it. Also with the humanities is mapping. So if you're using your school grounds for mapping, Again, if they need to have that laminated map, you will have to clean it or you can just print it off. And then once they've got it, then put it in the bin or they can create their own map out of natural materials on the ground. It might help to reinforce the zoning angle, but also places they are can and cannot go and also get them thinking about grid referencing and scale. And you can bring in some maths as well. Um, in expressive arts, there's so much natural art out there. Andy Goldsworthy has done some amazing ones and James Blunt, if you look at them up on Twitter, there's some amazing natural sculptures there, natural art. Also making natural instruments. There's obviously trumpets with the grass stems, but you can make kazoos. And again, if you can just get them to come up with some um, ideas, usually they come up with better ones than anyone else can. And they can create their own band outside. They can record it. They can try and use the rain or anything to make their own music and it just brings in you know, so much um, inventiveness. Also, creating things like leaves into masks. So take two holes out of your leaves, put it on your face, but then add things to it. Shadow drawing. Um, this has been big in lockdown for some reason, putting animals on a piece of paper and then drawing around them to make um, with their shadows. Mirror drawing is great for social distancing. You have two people sitting back to back, two meters apart. One person draws with chalk on the ground. And as they're drawing it, they describe what they're drawing to the other person. The other person has to draw it. And then you compare what you've done. Great for instructional writing. Um, I did this with a group to um, got them to try and draw a house. And every single one of them had an upside down triangle on top of a square. 
And if I said draw a house, they do it fine, but you suddenly realize your instructions have to be very precise. So it's a good way of monitoring how good your instructional language is. Now, I don't know if we've got any secondary teachers in here, but I'm gonna whiz through these in case you, we have. And in terms of what you can do in secondary, I'm gonna focus just on science, technology and humanities. So humanities, we've got obviously all the mapping that you can do, grid referencing, scale, compass, for orienteering. In the science, we've got the inquiries, adaptation, uh, reproduction and plants, great there, ecology, populations. We also can do fitnesses, creating pyramids of numbers with the data that's collected. And we can do some humanities, looking at carbon content of trees, microclimate, again, biodiversity. Right, okay. So those are some of my ideas. Now, before we go, if I can just, I just help you to see what kind of um, resources I can provide with to you. And hopefully you can then provide me with your details and I can then send this to you. First of all, I've got my YouTube channel. So please um, subscribe to Nature Days, hashtag Nature Days. And there's these, and of course you can give them to your home learners as well as use them in school. And they're all based on Key Stage 2, but really I've had four-year-olds doing it as well. And they're all fun, they're all curriculum linked, but they're only using the materials you'll have in your garden and using environments you'll have in your garden. Also, I've done some virtual field, tricks, field trips for school. So if you're doing a topic, probably more September than now, um, I can do a virtual field trip, which would involve me going to the environment and showing you what you could do there but also activities that you do in your school grounds so i'd be on screen in your school and then i tell you to go out you would do something come back and results and also we can have a live q a session as well uh, online i've condensed all the information i've said onto the padlet so this um is the link to the padlet i don't know if you can click on it in the screen if you can then just save that that's going to be up on the internet for forever and if you do find any good resources that you want to share you can add them to the padlet as well so please do add them to the padlet because the more resources we get together the better um if i have time i'll show you those i also can obviously still provide inset and add training for teachers um and they can be bespoke to your school so if you want me to go through something particularly or something i haven't you know covered enough in this webinar because it has been quite short then please contact me and I can design something for you specifically for your school. It can be through a webinar. So if you want to um, do it remotely like this, that's fine. Or I can come into your school if that's okay with your policies. There are field trips still available, but hopefully I'll be yeah, allowing you, well, you'll be allowed to come out with me. They will be slightly different. Obviously there will be social distancing. And also the only way we can do it at the moment is that you will have your parents will transport them to the location and pick them up so you don't have to worry about buses but in terms of socially distanced activities field work is perfectly easily to done with social distancing i could also come in and do outdoor learning in your school but of course you need to make sure that that's okay with your policies and then last i've got my outdoor learning cards which are all quickly linked and independent challenges based at key stage two but can be undertaken by foundation phase with support from either TAs or teachers. These are £50 for just over 50 of them. You can see them on the test website, you can buy them for the website but they are actually more expensive on there because they take a commission so if you email me um, then you can buy them and they involve each one of them is colour coded to the areas learning experience. They've each got a challenge question at the top and then it will tell you some approaches you could take. They've got pictures there to help you use things in your school grounds to answer the question. Maybe some ideas of what you might want to use. Some prompt questions either for TAs to use in support of foundation phase or for people who need scaffolding to help them get to the answer. The back of the card then has success criteria and a picture of somebody doing the activity to give them some ideas. And then at the very bottom, we've got some extension activities which will stretch the learners beyond the, the question and also beyond this AOLE into the other AOLEs. All the cards are designed in the same way so that there is this continuity. And when you buy them, you get sent a digital download, which you can print off and use as many times as you like in your school. You can also use it for homeschooling so you could send them home with the children. Because I think it's very nice that if you've got children who aren't being sent to school because um, their parents aren't happy with the situation, 
they could still do activities that the children are doing in school. So you could do one in school and then send one home and say, right, this is what we did in school today. Why don't you do it in your garden? And pretty much all of the cards can be done in a garden as well as in your school grounds. You don't have to have specialized school grounds to do any of these cards. So last thing, I've got a question for you. So if Steph can put this um, poll onto the chat, if you look at the chat, and if you could click on this for me, oh, you've done it already, you're a star. So if you can click on that poll for me, then you should get up a question. I need to come out of this first though. So if you can click on that, and then you should find you get a poll which says this question, would you be interested in further webinars? If you can just click on yes or no for me and I will get the data. And then I would, once you've clicked yes or no, I'll move on to the next question. And then if you can just answer the next question and I will just receive your vote or what you say there when I log in to my account. So. Okay, and then lastly, if you've done that, there's a um, feedback form. So if Steph can put the feedback form in, and if you could just fill it in, please, at some point. And then in the very bottom, if you can fill in your um, email address, then I will send you the presentation and any information, including the Padlet information, and so we can keep in contact. Now, I know I've gone on far too long, I do apologise. So what I'd like to do is open up to the floor. So if anybody has any questions, I'm just going to come out of sharing my screen. Okay, if you want to ask any questions, either on the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, you can do that, then please do. Hi, Dawn. Hi, Dawn, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Is that Steph? Hi. Hi. Yeah, sorry, it's only me. I've just had a couple of questions on the chat. Um, one from Kerry Osborne, she'd like to know, um, I think obviously you've covered this in the presentation, but um, ideas on ways, ways to engage year five pupils in the outdoors over the next uh, three weeks for year five. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, thank you Kerry. Um, I would still try with the year fives to try and focus on the health and well-being, but you could, if you wanted to just do a little project that lasted the three days that they are there, then maybe to get them to do a research project. So looking around your school grounds, um, doing a, um, a survey of what animals and plants are actually there. So doing some data collecting, and then they can do some research, they can create some fact files, and this will provide them with a bit more knowledge about their school grounds, but also will provide them with the, the skills of researching. And also they could create a resource that you could then really later on use for another year group so they're actually creating a resource for you that is useful but in terms of i really try and focus on the health and well-being so still doing lots of games but maybe trying to get them to start thinking about the learning they can do in their school grounds so scientific investigations uh, looking at how animals are adapted maybe can coming up with their own animals that, that would be adapted directly for your school grounds um, a great one is looking at survival year fives and year sixes love that survival situation so if we think right okay so without scaring them consider that we were actually in lockdown in the school now how could we survive what have we got in our school grounds that we can use to survive so where would we put up our camp can we build a little model of our den that we could build in so you could do individual models and then we could think about mapping those what could we use in our school grounds that will help us survive what do we need to survive so a, a kind of survival um, side is quite good. There's also um, lots of information about the maths. So if you want to do a lot on maths, numeracy and literacy, adventure stories, doing an adventure story based in your school grounds, and then they could video it as well, do themselves as narrating 
for them as they do a, an adventure story. Um, but hopefully I've covered a lot in the in the other slides as well. Any more stuff? Yeah, we've had a question from Ollie Mann. Um, he's looking, he's key stage three geography, looking for ideas around field work around the school grounds. And I know you talked earlier about microclimates, but he's just looking for some field work ideas, please. Yeah, microclimate is, is really good to do. Also, mapping of any kind. So if they've got their phones, doing some mapping using ArcGIS. So if you've got Survey123, Ollie, or you can download that, every school can get that for free. So if you look at um, Survey123 and ArcGIS, every school can get it for free. It's a field working data collection tool. So for Key Stage 3, it's a great way of introducing field work and you can make up your own surveys. And these surveys can be things like emotion mapping, could be land use mapping, and of course you could put in some quantitative data there as well. So it could be things that you're measuring. So transects, doing, looking at plant diversity, plant heights, that's all suitable in a field situation. You look at the impact of trampling along one location and then, or maybe the, the impact of direction on what type of species you've got. So you've got what I've said before about the shadow being over one side of the, of the yard, that might have an impact on your biodiversity. You could investigate that. But again, getting them to try and come up with some ideas for themselves so they come up with the questions because that's the most important thing when they come into Key Stage 4. But yeah, investigating, you know, using ArcGIS and 123 is going to be a great start for them if they can bring their phones into school. Thank you, Steph. Any more? Yes, we've had a couple of questions, I think from Fionn Williams and Kim Hudson. Um, just what your views are on social distancing? Well, unfortunately, we've got to be governed by the, the science and the, the guidance. So my opinion doesn't really matter. I think we need to go, to go up with. But in terms of foundation phase, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult to maintain that. There is a fantastic resource, which is a webinar which was undertaken by a doctor, an A&E, uh, a intensive care doctor in a COVID ward for head teachers, um, which goes through some some really good ways of trying to maintain social distancing with children without it being a big issue and some of the the key things that he said were very straightforward things like the fact that don't come down to the level of the children so if you think about that you're already if you're tall like me you're a bit ready a meter away from their mouth and remember it's two meters mouth to mouth so if you are standing up then you've got a meter already and then um, standing behind them if they're sitting down and that means you can just step backwards if they turn around and again you've got a meter in England today I know they've reduced it to a meter plus which means a meter when wearing a mask which seems makes no sense to me but in terms of the younger children I think it will be very difficult and it may be that your school has to get to the point where they say right it's it's just not feasible we're accepting that there will be um there will be a reduced distance between them but we're maintaining the bubbles so at least it's only within that small group and I think then that that would be feasible if your school risk assessed it and accepted that that's um, a risk that they're willing to take because they're reducing it by doing lots of hand washing and also limiting the number of interactions between the different uh, groups. Anything else Steph? Uh, no, I think that's it. We haven't had any more questions. I've put a request in the chat, um, but nothing else at the moment. Brilliant. Um, if anyone else has any, we've got a smaller number now, so if you do want to unmute yourself and say anything, then um, please do. If I'm sorry we've gone on far longer than I planned to. Anybody? Oh, if not, um, I'd just like to thank you very much for coming. And please, if you haven't, fill in the feedback form and write your email address at the bottom and then I'll be able to send you the presentation or you've got my email address if you've been emailed me and I will send you the presentation and all the details like the Padlet. Thanks, Dawn. Thank Amory. you. Oh, hi, Amory. Thank you very much. And I did write in the comment box that I've been lucky enough to see the cards and it's very, very much worth an investment from the school to save hours and hours worth of work. Really, really good, um, high quality, independent learning based on the new curriculum. Thank you. 
well done.